go live and it's rolling and rolling. all right and we are live good morning good afternoon good evening depending on where you are and when you are watching this facebook live this is the voice and the face of dr tolo levington ceo founder of living spring family medical center here in the awesome city of mansfield texas where we help our patients live long and well and we believe because we believe the quality of life is just as important as the quantity of life and i'm excited today to be doing a retake with the awesome Dr. Carolina Sueldo. I hope yes. I said that right. Oh, you um, did. <laughs> thank you. And we're going to be talking about the topic. I've been trying to get pregnant, Doc, what to do. And of course, talks with a fertility specialist. Thank you so much for coming. How are you doing? Dr. 1110, thank you so much for having me today. Um, I just want, before I start talking about myself, I want you to know I'm actually a big fan of yours. Um, I've been watching you for a while. I love, love, love what you're doing for your community and for you know the people of Texas. And um, so I'm, I'm really excited to be here today. Thank you. I'm honored that you're here. So thank you, thank you. The feeling is mutual. Um, <laughs> All right. So I already told people who you are, but kindly introduce yourself. Who are you and yeah. what do you do? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my name is Dr. Carolina Sweldo. I am a double board certified, both OBGYN and fertility specialist. So a little bit about me. Um, I actually come from an Argentine family. So the South American mm -hmm. country of Argentina. And when I was 15, we moved down there and I actually did high school and medical school there. And while in medical school, um, both my parents are physicians and, you know, my mom always said, do what you want to do because you're going to do it for the rest of your life. And really, you know, she wanted me to follow my dreams. My dad said, do what you want to do. But if you want to do infertility, that would be great. So my dad is actually a fertility specialist as well. Yeah. And he founded a practice in Central California in the mid 80s, right around the time I was born. Um, and he's had that practice ever since. And I, at the time, being in my 20s, was like, no, dad, like, I'm going to, you know, pave my own way and march my own, you know, to the beat of my own drum and whatnot. Um, but I really did fall in love with women's health. And it really came from a place of wanting to empower women with education and knowledge about their reproductive health. So I said, you know, I love this so much. Um, I want to do this and I'm going to do OBGYN. So it was really about, you know, contraceptive care, STDs, um, family planning. There was, you know, it was really in that focus. And so I said, okay, dad, I'm going to do OBGYN, but I'm not doing infertility. And once I actually started residency and got to see what was done in infertility, specifically in the IVF lab, I mean, it's it's phenomenal. It really is something that is incredibly amazing. Um, and I, and I, I was really drawn to it because of the science. It's a young field. Um, you know, the studies are still changing practice. There's still a lot that's, you know, yet to be learned and, and to understand. Um, but I've been in practice almost a decade now. And, and with that said, I really, really fell in love with it because of the patients. Um, it's really a unique bond that you form with your patients. And I have patients, you know, still from my first years of practice who send me cards with updates about their kiddos. And I think um, as physicians, you know, we, this is our every day. But for that family, like you help them grow their family, you help them really, you know, with a miracle in, in their eyes. And so it really is a, a very special thing that I get to do. And I don't take that responsibility lightly. Awesome. I can tell you have an obvious passion for the. Yes. <laughs> so your patients are very lucky to have you. So this is this is. Good. Thank you. Thank you. I have someone who's watching, you know what, you know, if you have patients, I have patients who come to me and say, Doc, we've been trying for three months. We've been trying for six months, some say nine months, some say over a year. When should, how long after actively trying should, should one get concerned about trying or not getting pregnant? That is, yeah, that's a, my, one of my favorite questions because I think, you know, we don't talk about this enough. And I think people mm -hmm. a lot of times feel like they're in the dark. They're not sure. Is it the right time, et cetera? Mm -hmm. So there's a couple different definitions and, and the classic textbook definition is related right. to time. So if a, if a couple is under the age of 35, they've been having unprotected intercourse for over 12 months or over a year, and right. they have not been successful in getting pregnant, then it is time to see a specialist, at a minimum, get an evaluation, and in most cases, begin fertility treatment. Mm 
So typically, if you're under 35 and you've been trying for over a year, it's time. But that's not the only parameter because we know there's a concept called ovarian aging or reproductive aging. And we see it in both men and women, but the timelines are very different. So in women, we know that above the age of 35, we begin to see a very real decline in fertility, specifically in the number of eggs that they have and in the quality of those eggs. So for women who are over 35, we actually cut back that timeline to six months. So if they're over 35, they've been trying for more than six months and they're unsuccessful, then it's definitely time to see a specialist. Now, there are other reasons why you would see a fertility specialist sooner. Some of the classic ones that I like to talk about, number one, if you do not have regular cycles, so let's say you're skipping two, three months at a time, you have unpredictable ovulation, you don't know when to time intercourse, please don't wait six months, please don't wait a year, please make sure you see a fertility specialist sooner than that. Another classic one is a patient who has very, very painful, debilitating pain with her period, also possibly pain with intercourse. This may be related to a disease called endometriosis. And so for those patients, we definitely don't want to wait um, as long either. Now, for some patients, they may know that they have risk factors. Let's say they had an STD in their adolescence or in their 20s, and we believe that the tubes may be at risk, Mm -hmm. or they had a previous surgery where maybe an ovary or a fallopian tube was removed, or there's a family history. Let's say the family history is of fibroids or endometriosis, and so they're concerned they may have these things. All of these are reasons enough to at least have a conversation with your OBGYN, and if not them, then also a fertility specialist. Now, I don't wanna forget about the guys, because they're just as important in this equation. right? And for men, we typically talk about doing a semen analysis as part of the fertility workup. And the time frame that's six months to a year for the couple stands true. But let's say the man has a history of an undescended testicle or a genetic family history, or they have some sort of medical disease, for example, a long-term diabetic, they're at risk for infertility. So we really want to make sure that we're not just focusing solely on the female partner. If there is a male partner, we want to make sure we're reviewing his history as well. It takes two. So I I like that. Uh, yes. you're, you're addressing both issues and it varies depending on age. Yes. So yes. You were over 35. There's hope. Don't let that, <laughs> don't let that number um, um, scare you. But I will say this because I didn't mention it earlier, but those who are watching live, hashtag live, those who are watching replay, hashtag replay. And Dr. Sueldo has graciously, graciously agreed to offer um, um, live coaching free of charge, um, not live coaching, but one-on-one coaching to one one person or one couple um, after this. So um, I want to say thank you to doing that. Um, and it, it's going to be based on whoever who emails us or actually sends us a message to the clinic, um, first come, first serve. Um, but thank you. I wanted to highlight that because that's a big deal coming from, from her. Um, thank you for being gracious enough to do that. <laughs> Work, the work you do is yeah the work that you do is so special I've been looking forward to this live for for a long time now so the fact that we're doing a retake we knew we had to make it extra special for the audience awesome 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 now for someone who's watching who's like um duh you know I agree there are things to do IVF different things are there things I can do naturally to enhance the chances of me getting pregnant what would you say to that definitely. Definitely. So always when I'm talking to patients about the treatment approach, I'm talking about a three pronged or three armed approach. So we talk about lifestyle and that's the focus I'm going to, I'm going to have today. We talk about supplements, which I'm also going to mention. And then third would be the fertility treatment, treatment piece. So what you do at home is actually just as important as what we're doing in the clinic. So things that we want to look at in a, in a couple who is actively trying to get pregnant is, number one, from a lifestyle standpoint, how is our nutrition, how is our exercise, how is our sleep, because we know that sleep is one of the pillars of health. We know that especially now post-pandemic, we're seeing more and more uh, sleep disorders. 
Right. Number four, are there any work exposures? So there's actually some literature on um, firefighters, on long distance truck drivers, on hair salon workers, on a hair salon all day. So are there any work exposures that could potentially be risk factors for infertility? And you really want to focus on all of those things. And then the last piece I always like to talk about is stress management. We know that when a couple begins trying to conceive, um, there it becomes very stressful, right? It becomes very mechanical, medicalized. And so we really want to make sure that the couple is proactive about how they're managing their, that stress, whether it's with meditation, yoga, uh, counseling, online or group support. So there's many different ways of what that looks like, but it is important. The next thing I'll say is, do you feel optimized in your health? So are you at your optimal weight? Are you are your medical diseases, let's say somebody has thyroid disease, or let's say, you know, we mentioned diabetes earlier, um, you know, if they have an autoimmune disease like lupus, are all of these things optimized and well controlled? And if you're on medication, are those medications safe for you to be taking when you get pregnant? Or are those medications you should change and adjust and become stable on the new medication before you try to get pregnant? What I always tell patients is you don't want to be changing medications once you're already pregnant. Mm -hmm. So if you are, let's say you have high blood pressure and you are on a medication, you want to make sure that that medication is safe to take while pregnant. And you want to switch that now if you're not. Okay. So medical diseases, medications, optimal weight, et cetera. That's from a lifestyle standpoint. From a supplement standpoint, most OBGYNs and fertility specialists will agree that we want to make sure the patient is taking a prenatal vitamin with at least 400 micrograms of folic acid, which is contained in most over-the-counter prenatal vitamins. And you want to make sure you're actually taking that before you start trying to conceive, because ideally those folic acid stores would be replenished at least one month before conception. In the last five years, we also see a lot of literature coming out on vitamin D, D as in David, um, and the fact that it may be implicated not only in our general well-being and general health, but also in reproductive health. And so that's really important that if, you're, if your um, primary isn't checking it or that you're supplementing with it um, to make sure your vitamin D levels are appropriate. Every other supplement is really going to be tailored to the patient's individual case. So for example, if a patient is not ovulating regularly, they have a disease, for example, known as PCOS, there may be a supplement called inositol that is recommended. If a patient has a low egg reserve, they may uh, be recommended to take something like CoQ10 or DHEA. So the, there's a few other supplements that are out there that you may read about, but they really should be tailored to the patient's individual case. So outside of prenatal vitamin, folic acid, vitamin D, there's really nothing that I would sort of recommend blanket across the board for everybody. And then the third thing that I talk about is monitoring ovulation. So if you are having regular monthly cycles, which hopefully you should be, if not, you'd be talking to your doctor. And so you should look back and be able to say, okay, I have regular 28-day cycles, 30-day cycles. And we know that ovulation is occurring approximately two weeks before the onset of menses. So if you have 28-day cycle, so two weeks before that is going to be cycle day 14. If you have a 30 30 day cycle or 35 day cycle, you're going to be ovulating later in the month. And the reason that this is important is because when you are using, when you're checking for ovulation, and we're going to get to that in a second, you don't want to be discouraged. So you want to know the cycle length so that you can know when to check for ovulation. Right. As far as checking for ovulation, I do, I do recommend ovulation predictor kits. These are basically urine strips. You check your urine once a day. They're found in any feminine hygiene aisle in any pharmacy or big box store. And essentially you would start checking a couple days before ovulation. Once you get a positive, the recommendation is to have intercourse the day of the positive and the day after. So for example, kind of the classic textbook example, 28 day cycle, we expect ovulation around day 14. The patient may start testing around day 10 to 12. They'll get a positive around day 14. They have intercourse day 14 and 15. This serves two purposes. One, obviously, is to optimize the likelihood of pregnancy because we know that we want to try and catch 
you know, the egg in its optimal timing with the sperm. But secondly, I think it also serves a really important purpose in the relationship. Because when a couple is trying to conceive, if you tell somebody to have intercourse every other day for three weeks, or if you tell them to have intercourse, you know, every day around the time of ovulation for 10 days, it can become very automatic. Mm -hmm. um, it can really strip away any intimacy for the couple. And so allowing them to identify, okay, this is when I'm ovulating, this is when intercourse is happening, allows for the rest of the month to really be dedicated to intimacy and reconnecting with your partner. I like it. Sorry, I, I went a little long there. I apologize. No, no, no. no. <laughs> very, very helpful information. I love that you addressed the supplement piece because people, um, you know, have had questions about that already. Um, you talked about the lifestyle piece too. Um, of course, you know, healthy eating, exercise, making sure stress is managed and sleeping well are also very, very important. Um, now, of course, we all know these are medical uh, suggestions. Uh, it's important that you make an appointment with your doctor to have a unique or individualized plan for yourself. And thank you, Ms. Makita, yes. for joining. Nice seeing you. But Doc, very, very loaded with information. So I'm hoping that people are taking notes. I'm I'm taking notes. Um, and of course, <laughs> tag beautiful and share with those who will find this useful. My next question to you is this. Um, now, I already you already talked about the things that can increase the chances of getting pregnant. Are there ones, like you say, three or four that you've seen are um are things that reduce the chances of getting pregnant that people should be to pay attention to, what would you say? Yes. Um, so the American Society of Reproductive Medicine actually has a really nice little table um, that looks at things like caffeine, alcohol, tobacco, recreational drugs, and I think there's one other one I'm, I'm missing. Um, and it talks about the increase, the relative increase in infertility that we see in that population. So let's take alcohol. Um, that And these are some of the very common questions that I get. And I, I believe that our American culture is, is um, alcohol is very, you know, a social event. It's something that we do a lot of. Um, and we all enjoy a glass of wine or two or three. Um, and, and it's really important because we do see that when there is an increased intake in alcohol, um, we do see decreased rates of fertility, both in men and women. Um, in men, we see a decrease in, in sperm motility, uh, potentially even in concentration. And in women, we can also see decreased likelihood of pregnancy. So when couples are trying to conceive, I do recommend that they try to keep the alcohol to a minimum so as to optimize. And this comes back to that lifestyle optimization piece. We really want to make sure we're doing everything we can um, to try for conception. The second one is caffeine. I get this question all the time. And what I typically tell patients is that if you are somebody who drinks one 12 ounce cup of coffee a day, that's fine. That is not going to cause infertility. It actually has been in many studies shown to be okay in pregnancy. As Dr. Labatan said, this is not medical advice. So definitely talk to your doctor. But generally speaking, the literature tends to be supportive in terms of the safe, safety profile. Now, let's say you're somebody who, you know, drinks, a, you know, triple venti shot espresso and then an energy drink at lunch. And then you're drinking caffeine throughout the day and you're really exceeding um, sort of that daily limit. Mm -hmm. We actually have seen decreased uh, fertility in those patients, both again, both men and women. As far as tobacco, um, we also see that. And, and nicotine is, you know, one of my uh, most hated enemies. I see and I see it, I mean, it's quite obvious in somebody who is a smoker, the decrease in the egg quantity, so something known as diminished ovarian reserve, as well as the egg quality, um, is quite obvious in, in somebody who smokes tobacco. So definitely not recommended. And all of these things are not recommended in pregnancy. So, you know, the conversation that I have with people is if you're going to have to stop it in pregnancy anyway, then why not get a head start and really try to optimize your lifestyle before you become pregnant and settle into that new change. The other thing that I always say is that this is a we problem and not a me problem. So if, you know, mm. the woman is not the only one who has to make these changes. If, you know, if she needs to consider, let's just say a health journey for weight optimization, or if she needs to decrease her alcohol intake, guess what? Her partner is right there alongside her doing the exact same thing because this is a joint venture and this is something that they want to achieve together. And so he or she, whoever the partner may be, needs to really 
um, be in support and, and be in alignment with the, with the desired goal. So I like the, the fact that you, you, you mentioned that it, it, it's, it's not just the one is both. And it's very important that um, both parties are working together. Um, yes. One of the common things I see is, you know, the woman telling me that, Oh, you know, her husband doesn't want to go get checked because she thinks yep. think it's, it's her. And I, you know, it takes two. Um, having having that mindset is very, very important to increase the chances also of having um, kids. Now, my next absolutely, question and I think I'm so sorry to interrupt you. I think that um, you know the public or the non medical audience really doesn't understand just how common male fertility is. When we do the breakdown of causes of fertility, we see a male factor almost 50% of the time, because we know that 30% of the time, it's a male factor issue alone. 30% of the time, it's a female factor alone. But 20% of the time, it's actually both. So when you combine that, it's actually a very high number of cases where we have male factor infertility. I think there's a lot of cultural taboo and, and, you know, men associate fertility in the semen sample with manhood. And, and, you know, if there's an issue, then somehow they're less of a man. So I think there's a lot of fear um, behind getting checked because they don't want there to be a problem. But it's right. super important because it's just as common as female infertility. And one other factor that I wanted to mention before we move on to the next question is weight. We know that being underweight or being obese has a direct implication with fertility. If you're underweight, we know that that impacts hormone changes. Um, and, and essentially think of the body going into starvation mode. It's not that pregnancy is not possible, but it becomes a lot more difficult because now mm -hmm. the body is sort of in survival mode, if you will. And for obese patients, both men and women, what happens is that the fatty tissue, it contains, and I, I won't get too medical here, but it contains an enzyme called aromatase. And aromatase makes estrogen. So in women, the effect of that fatty tissue making estrogen is, you know, imagine you and I here, we're, we're talking in a room directly to each other versus if there's estrogen around from the fatty tissue, we're talking to each other across an entire conference room. So there's so much chatter in between that the communication mm -hmm. between the brain and the ovary gets muddled and it doesn't function properly. For the men, the same is also true. When you have estrogen circulating from that fatty tissue, we actually see a decrease in testosterone production. And as a consequence of that decrease in testosterone, we see a decrease in sperm production. So obesity in and of itself is absolutely a reversible risk factor for infertility in both men and women. So I just wanted to highlight that before we move on. Very good point. So maintaining a healthy weight either way, under and yes. over, um, is important, making sure that we're in the, within the normal range as best as possible. All right, N next question, let's talk myths. Um, so I have um, I have a patient who says, oh, I'm told that certain position during intercourse increases the chances of having twins or getting pregnant. What would you say to, the, to that? So uh, <laughs> um, there are a lot of myths out there uh, surrounding pregnancy, and um, I wish I could dispel them all with one Facebook Live, but <laughs> I don't think that's going to be the case. I'll probably have to be doing lives until the day I die. The short answer is that there's been no position that has been associated with an increased risk of pregnancy, excuse me, increased chance of pregnancy or increased chance of twins. So the short answer to that is no. Myth busted. Okay. All right. Next bit. Um, position uh, pos positions that increases the, the chances of having a male versus a female. Okay. Perfect. So again, this one's no. And when people ask me, you know, positions for male, female, I'll typically say, yeah, 50% because 50% chance it's a boy, 50% chance it's a girl. Right. Um, this goes back to a theory that came out in the seventies and it's um, Netter's theory where based on the timing of the cycle of ovulation, theoretically earlier in the cycle was more likely to be a boy later in the cycle was more likely to be a girl that actually has been dispelled. And he himself towards the end of his life said, you know, in fact, um, that is probably not true. So, uh, no, the short answer, no myth busted. All right. Awesome. Now this one is a little bit of a, um, I don't know, a sensitive subject, but sometimes there's the blaming game, like where I have patients say, you know, I, I, you know, I took birth control. That's why, or, um, maybe some of my early lifestyles. And so, you know, it's my fault. And, 
Um, but the big one, especially I'll say birth control. Uh, happy yeah. since I, it was when I started birth control that I probably messed this up. What would you say to that? Yeah. Yeah. So I think um, it's human nature to want to find a culprit, right? We want to find a reason. We want to find the guilty party. That's just human nature. And unfortunately, because infertility is still a young field, many times we do not find a reason. 20% of the time I diagnose what's called unexplained infertility, which is basically a negative evaluation. And what I typically tell patients is it's not unexplained. It's just that the testing available today is not finding whatever the problem is. So what we know, and, and birth control has been around for a long time now. So we have a lot, a lot of data when it comes to birth control and fertility. And what we know is that birth control has zero impact on a patient's future fertility. We know that birth control, once it's stopped, and there's a, so there's an immediate return to baseline, right? There's a reset of the hormones. You go into that first ovulatory cycle and pregnancy is just as possible then as it is three months or six months or a year after stopping the birth control. So there's zero correlation between birth control and pregnancy or infertility, I should say, and birth control and irregular cycles. Now, what a lot, what happens with a lot of my patients is that they went on birth control for irregular cycles, or they went on birth control for painful periods. And so I'm seeing them now in their late twenties or early thirties, they're now trying to get pregnant and they're saying, well, I was on birth control for 10 plus years. And so this must be the reason when in fact, what's happening is that there's a return to their baseline fertility and their baseline fertility is abnormal. If you have irregular cycles, you're not ovulating normally. If you have very painful periods, potentially you have endometriosis. Both of those are medical diseases associated with infertility. So it's not the birth control, but potentially the reason that you were started on birth control in the first place. Ah, uh, I see. I see. All right. Awesome. 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 Now I'll say this. I have someone who's watching who's like, doc, I'm, I'm thankful that you came on to have this discussion, but I'm feeling overwhelmed with all of this. And we've been trying for a couple of months and now I'm I'm a little nervous. What would you say to that person? How would you address, you know, as far as getting ready for the next steps? What would you say to them, Doc? Yeah. Yeah. And I think I it, it's so interesting to me because we all grow up um, trying to avoid pregnancy, right? So we all grow up trying to be responsible, trying to do the right thing, make sure we're ready, et cetera. And then once we're ready, it's like we want to be pregnant yesterday, right? Like it's like, okay, I, I stopped my birth control. I'm ready to go. I'm all lined up. Let's do this. Um, and so there is definitely a big stress component that comes along with the trying to conceive journey. So what I typically talk about is number one, communication with your partner. For those that don't have a partner with your support system, you know, you want to bring at least somebody into your circle that may not be family and friends. You may not want to share that journey. It may be a support group. It may be a counselor. It may be a therapist, whatever that looks like for you. If you have a partner, I strongly encourage communication with your partner, verbalize what's going on, planning, communicating, et cetera, et cetera. Number two, is going to be, okay, let me go down my lifestyle. Let me make sure we're checking all the boxes in terms of optimization of lifestyle, because that's fair. I mean, that's fairly straightforward. It's a lot of common sense. I don't think you have to be a doctor to understand sort of, am I at my healthiest self or not? And if I'm not, what can I do to get myself there? The third one is at minimum a prenatal vitamin. And if you're already taking a daily multivitamin, that's great. Just switch that out and incorporate that into your daily routine. And then the fourth one is if you're having regular cycles, the ovulation predictor kit. So communication, lifestyle, supplements, and then the ovulation predictor kit to be able to time intercourse. And if you're not having regular cycles, well, that's your first check. You need to go see a doc and get tested. But if you are having regular cycles, that ovulation predictor kit will be your friend over the next few months. And the last thing I would say, let's say you're under 35 and let's say you're using an ovulation predictor kit and you're four or five months in and you are just stressed out of your mind. Every single time you get a period, you are you know, it, it's anger and guilt and shame and crying and emotions. And when you get a baby shower announcement, it, you know, it tri it's triggering. Or if some, a friend tells you they're pregnant, it's triggering. So even if it hasn't been a year, 
if you are starting to have those symptoms of, of stress and stress management and those trigger sensations, I would just say, go, go see a specialist, go get mm. tested. You don't have to pursue treatment, but at least you know that everything is okay. And, and I would say that, you know, those four things, if I can walk away with anything was, so would be the communication, the lifestyle, the supplements, the, the ovulation predictor kit, but then also feeling empowered and self-advocating, you know, if you're three, four months into the journey and you, you're like a year, like I cannot right. not do a year, um, then, then don't, that's totally up to you to move that gas pedal down a little bit faster. Awesome. Awesome. I hope, um, I hope that those who are watching are taking notes and I'm sure people come to mind as you're listening to this, you can please feel free to share with them. And doc, my final question to you is this, people are watching like, man, I, I like this doc. I like how she explains things. I like how she breaks things down in ways I can understand. I can relate. I like how supportive she sounds. Doc, where can people find you? Thank you so much, Dr. Tolu. Um, so this has been amazing. I'm actually on social. I'm on both Facebook and Instagram. I'm much more active on Instagram. So I would love, you are watching this live, either live or on replay. Shoot me a DM, a direct message on Instagram. Let me know what you thought of the live. Let me know if you enjoyed the content. I would love to hear from you, um, especially if you work with Dr. Tolu because she is an incredible human being. Um, and they're easy to find me. So both Facebook and Instagram, Dr. Carolina Sweldo. And I also have a YouTube channel. Uh, the YouTube channel is also under my name, Dr. Carolina Sweldo. I drop videos every Monday, 10 minute clips, no longer um, on different aspects related to infertility. I talk a lot, a lot more in depth about the things that we discussed here today. And in my Instagram, you'll see the sign up for my weekly newsletter to hear we every week from me um, with a little snippet of information. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. And once we're done with this, we'll make sure that we put um, your information there for people to connect with you either as a speaker or to connect with you one-on-one -on -one and, and everything else. But thank you so much for coming. This has been very useful. Um, and for those of you if, who didn't join us earlier, Dr. Sueldo did offer a free coaching session to the first person that would email me. I had to give that information to her and she can connect with you and offer her excellent um coaching advice in regards to, um, fertility issues. Okay. So that's, yeah, I know. I know Maggie that. Yes, she did. Yes, 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 she did. That's, that's her heart. So <laughs> thank that's a, big that's a big deal. So thank you so much for doing this. Um, and for those of you who are looking for an awesome, a thorough, a passionate family physician in the Matthew, Texas area, well, you know, someone who needs one, I am she. You have a good one, okay? Thank you, Dr. Sueldo. Thank you. This was good. Thank you so much. This was an honor. I'm so happy we got to do this. I agree. I agree. Bye. All right.